Endeavour Houston, we see a nominal Miko. Welcome to space. Re-entry is a daunting part of spaceflight, especially when you're in a large spacecraft that has to land on a runway as a glider. This is Space Shuttle Re-entry Guidance and Control. Our objective is to get the Space Shuttle Orbiter from low Earth orbit, travelling at approximately 7 km per second, to a complete stop on a runway, in this case the shuttle landing facility at the Kennedy Space Center. To begin re-entry, the orbiter will conduct a de-orbit burn, bringing our trajectory on a path to intersect the atmosphere. Controlling how much aerodynamic drag the orbiter generates is essential, ensuring that we lose altitude and velocity at the correct rate to reach the runway. In fact, this is so important, the re-entry guidance system thinks in terms of drag. Or if you prefer more technical terms, it operates in a velocity drag state space. This is a drag versus velocity graph, and it's a major part of shuttle re-entry guidance. This green line shows a generic shuttle re-entry profile, and the shape of this line is influenced by some upper and lower boundaries. In blue, we have the overshoot boundary, generating too little drag. This is known as a soft boundary, because crossing this boundary won't destroy the orbiter, but it will really ruin your day. You'll potentially skip back out of the atmosphere with less than great prospects of a second re-entry attempt. Up above, in red, we've got the undershoot boundary, generating too much drag. This is a hard boundary, because crossing this boundary will cause damage to the orbiter, by exceeding structural and thermal limits. Between these upper and lower boundaries, we are left with the flight corridor, and it leaves us with a little bit of wiggle room to adjust our drag profile throughout the re-entry to ensure that we can fly the correct distance to the runway. I said this is a generic profile, and that's because every space shuttle flight is different, depending on things such as payload return mass and orbital inclination. The boundaries and nominal drag profile will be tailored for each flight. We've now established that controlling drag is very, very important, but that raises the question, how do we control drag? First, let's start with something called angle of attack. Angle of attack is the angle between airflow and a wing, and of course, in this instance, that airflow is just opposite to our velocity, so a simplification we can make in some cases such as this is to say that angle of attack is the angle between the wing and our velocity. Right now you can see the orbiter flying at an angle of attack of 40 degrees. From this perspective, we can see drag is generated by the oncoming airflow pushing on the orbiter. When the angle of attack is increased, a larger forward cross-sectional area is presented towards the oncoming airflow, and so the orbiter experiences more drag. When the angle of attack is decreased, less cross-sectional area is presented to the airflow, and so drag decreases. However, angle of attack doesn't just influence drag, it also influences lift. As our angle of attack increases, our lift and drag both increase. While our drag will keep increasing, lift will only increase to a point, then start to decrease. This does make sense, right? You wouldn't expect a wing perpendicular to airflow like this to generate any lift, but you would expect it to generate a lot of drag. We can combine lift and drag together into a lift to drag ratio, and then compare this to angle of attack. And so here, we have a lift to drag ratio versus angle of attack curve, referred to as a lift curve. At the top of the lift curve, we find the critical angle of attack, where we have the highest lift to drag ratio. Flying at a lower angle of attack than this, is known as flying on the front side of the lift curve. However, during re-entry, the orbiter flies on the back side of the lift curve, having an angle of attack higher than the critical angle. We've seen that we can use angle of attack to control how much drag the orbiter experiences, 
but this is only fine control. In the early re-entry phases, aerothermal constraints limit us to stay pretty close to 40 degrees angle of attack. The small changes that we can make to our angle of attack of about plus or minus 3 degrees are called alpha modulation. But alpha modulation alone is insufficient for achieving the drag profile that we saw earlier. We need another method of controlling our drag, and this is an indirect one, bank angle. Bank angle is the angle of rotation about the axis of the velocity vector. If we look at the orbiter from the front along the velocity vector, we can see a bank angle of 0 degrees. Now let's increase the bank angle to 20 degrees, and increase it again to 60. That's bank angle. Let's take a different viewpoint now to note something very important. Bank angle and angle of attack are independent of one another. I can change the shuttle's bank angle without changing the angle of attack. And vice versa, I can change the angle of attack without changing the bank angle. Now how does bank angle influence our drag when it clearly doesn't change the frontal area presented to airflow like angle of attack did? The effect of increasing our bank angle is to point less of our lift upwards by pointing it sideways. With a 0 degree bank angle, all of our lift is pointing straight up, but with say a 45 degree bank angle, half of our lift is pointed up, and half is pointing sideways. By controlling how much vertical lift is exerted, we can influence the orbiter's descent rate. By influencing descent rate, we can influence drag. This is because drag is proportional to the square of velocity, and descent rate is a component of our velocity. Hence this chain of effects. Increased bank angle decreases vertical lift, which increases descent rate, adding to our velocity, hence adding to our drag. And vice versa. Decreased bank angle, increases vertical lift, decreasing descent rate, decreasing velocity, and decreasing drag. There we have our two methods of controlling our drag, directly with angle of attack, and indirectly with bank angle. And we use these two methods simultaneously to achieve the desired drag profile. This leads us to another question. How do we control our bank angle and angle of attack? At the start of re-entry, there's no atmosphere around us, so our aerodynamic control surfaces consisting of the body flap, elevons, and rudder aren't very useful. So we'll use the reaction control system thrusters. These are small thrusters located at various positions around the orbiter, used to provide precise maneuvering control while we were in orbit. However, we don't have to rely on the reaction control system for too long. As we enter the atmosphere, dynamic pressure starts to build up fairly quickly, allowing us to switch from reaction control to aerodynamic control. Interestingly, the yaw axis with the rudder is the last control axis to transition from reaction to aerodynamic control, and the reason is pretty neat. It's because of our high 40 degree angle of attack, meaning the rudder is in the orbiter's aerodynamic wake. There's simply not enough dynamic pressure back there for the rudder to be effective until the orbiter starts to pitch its nose down late into the re-entry. While we're on the topic of aerodynamics, you may have wondered why the orbiter's wings have these sticky addy front bits. These are leading edge root extensions, and they form part of the orbiter's double delta wing, comprising of the extensions themselves and the main wing. To put it simply, a delta wing is a triangular shaped wing, taken from the Greek capital letter delta, which looks like a triangle. Part of how delta wings generate lift is through generation of a vortex at the leading edge of the wing, creating sort of a suction effect on the upper surface. The more extreme the angle of a delta wing, the wider range of speeds and angles of attack where it can generate a reliable vortex. And so the orbiter's leading edge root extensions work to provide that capability, 
of stable lift generation in a wider flight envelope than it would otherwise be capable of. We've now seen the importance of controlling drag to stay within the boundaries of the flight corridor and how the orbiter achieves this desired drag profile, giving us the ability to safely control how much range we can fly to reach the runway. There is now another crucial aspect to re-entry guidance, cross-range control. We need to ensure that we actually fly towards the runway. For this, let's take a top-down perspective. The velocity vector shows our current direction of travel, and this dotted line shows our displacement from the runway. The angle between these two is called azimuth error. And in the guidance system, there's an acceptable value of azimuth error called dead band. Remember earlier when I was talking about bank angle and how we use it to control drag? Well, a side effect of bank angle is that we're pointing some of the orbiter's lift sideways. This will continually push the velocity vector to that side, affecting our azimuth error. All we have to do to keep azimuth error within dead band is to flip the direction of our bank angle every time our azimuth error reaches the dead band. Reversing the direction of the bank angle is a manoeuvre called a roll reversal. And I want to be very clear that controlling azimuth error is the sole purpose of roll reversals, and it affords the orbiter some cross-range capability. Cross-range is the distance capable of being flown to the side of a straight line path, allowing for corrected alignment with the landing site. Sometimes roll reversals are incorrectly referred to as an S-turn or a braking maneuver, but S-turns are something entirely different that I will come to later, and roll reversals actually have an unintended opposite effect to braking. They actually cause a temporary decrease in drag, because the bank angle has to be reduced and pass through zero degrees while reversing the direction. To offset this short drag decrease, the orbiter will increase alpha modulation during the roll reversal, and at the end of the roll reversal, perform a temporary overbank to increase drag. We have now covered the general principles of re-entry guidance. Now let's step through the specific guidance phases. First is the constant heat rate phase. During this phase, the drag profile is carefully designed so that the conductive heat flux into the heat shield tiles is in equilibrium with the radiative heat flux out of the tiles, ensuring steady state temperature within thermal limits. Let's look at a thermal protection system tile. The temperature limits we're concerned with are the front face temperature and the back face temperature. If we're too aggressive with our drag during this phase, we'll heat the tiles too quickly, outpacing their ability to radiate away heat, and the maximum front face temperature will be exceeded, causing the tile to fail or become damaged preventing reuse. However, if we're not aggressive enough with our drag, we'll exceed the back face limit, and that does sound a little counterintuitive. But this is because even with minimal drag, we're still heating the tile a lot, and by now extending this heating over a longer period of time, we're giving time for that heat to conduct through to the back face, where it can damage the orbiter's aluminium airframe. The constant heat rate phase was the highest heating region of the re-entry, and before NASA's TDRS relay satellites were set up, this phase would incur a communications blackout due to the plasma buildup around the orbiter. The next phase is the equilibrium glide phase. It kicks in after our velocity reaches below about 6.2 km per second. Equilibrium glide is sort of a buffer phase between the high heating portion of re-entry and the high deceleration portion lower in the atmosphere. This phase is designed to give the orbiter an opportunity to correct large ranging errors, and that can be accomplished by commanding an increase or decrease in the desired drag levels within the flight corridor. Next up is the constant drag phase, and its name is pretty self-explanatory. It kicks in when the drag deceleration of the orbiter reaches a desired value, nominally 10 meters per second squared, but this can change in order to correct ranging errors. Throughout this phase, the drag deceleration value was, well, kept constant, 
and the orbiter would start the process of decreasing its angle of attack as it starts to get into the thicker atmosphere. The angle of attack is lowered from 40 degrees to about 33 degrees. We're now onto the final phase of re-entry guidance. This is the transition phase. This phase transitions the orbiter into flying much more like a conventional aeroplane. The angle of attack continues to be decreased, transitioning to flying on the front side of the lift curve that I mentioned earlier, and this significantly reduces the drag the orbiter experiences. Those are the phases of re-entry guidance, and now for something completely different. At 90 kilometers from the runway, at an altitude of 24 kilometers, while traveling at 750 meters per second, re-entry guidance terminates. Re-entry is now over, and we enter a new guidance regime called Terminal Area Energy Management. Under Terminal Area Energy Management, we're now flying much more like a conventional aeroplane, and the guidance system is no longer operating in a velocity drag state space like it did during re-entry. Instead, it's thinking in terms of energy. The energy the orbiter has is a combination of gravitational potential energy resulting from its altitude and kinetic energy resulting from its velocity. There are three phases in terminal area energy management, acquisition phase, heading alignment phase, and pre-final phase. At the start of terminal area energy management, if the orbiter has excess energy, this is where it has the option to perform a braking S-turn maneuver. If an S-turn isn't necessary, or it's completed and the orbiter is at nominal energy, the orbiter will proceed through the acquisition phase. This is a top-down diagram of the landing site, showing the features of terminal area energy management. There is an imaginary line extending from the runway center line, making the final approach path, and placed tangentially to it are four hacks, where hack stands for heading alignment cone. These are single rotation spiral descent paths. The largest two hacks are placed at the nominal entry point, and the smallest two hacks are placed at the minimum entry point. The acquisition phase flies the orbiter on a tangent path to intersect one of the hacks. The target hack entry point is designated waypoint 1. Nominally, the hack positioned on the far side of the extended runway centerline is targeted, like you can see right now. This is called an overhead approach. In a low energy scenario, or in case of other influencing factors like weather, the hack on the near side can be targeted, creating what's called a straight-in approach. In a very low energy scenario, one of the minimum entry point hacks can be targeted. The diameter of a hack can be modified during the turn to ensure nominal energy dissipation, as well as use of the orbiter's iconic split rudder speed brake. Upon exiting the hack, the orbiter is lined up with the runway and established on the glide slope in the pre-final phase. And then, terminal area energy management guidance ends, switching over to approach and landing guidance, where the commander will fly the orbiter through a smooth touchdown, and eventually come to a full stop on the runway. That is Space Shuttle Reentry Guidance and Control. This video was brought to you by my supporters on Patreon, with special credit going to the highest tier Martian Orbit patrons. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, check out the shuttle's payload bay for more Simply Space.